Ever since Slay the Spire popularized the video game deck builder, there's been a question about who would be the next big name in the genre. And dozens have tried, but nobody's come close to creating the same level of hubbub until Monster Train. And after finally getting to play it, I can see why. Monster Train does a lot to streamline the deck builder format and make it more accessible. There are two major halves to a deck builder's appeal, the creative fun of exploring a game's systems and finding cool and interesting ways for different mechanics to interact, and the strategic long-term roguelike side of the game that requires you to carefully sculpt your deck and navigate hundreds of micro decisions and play probability games to give yourself the best fighting chance possible. Deck builders are games that satisfy both the creative mad scientist and the meticulous tactician. But Monster Train doubles down almost entirely on that first half, creating an exciting and flashy game that's bursting at the seams with cool ideas to explore, but it's also one of the most accessible and relaxed deck builders I've ever played, simplifying much of the genre's supporting meta layer. There is a degree of nuance lost in Monster Train, but it still remains a game tailor-made to have the broadest appeal possible, offering a great jumping on point if you've never tried something in this genre, while still having something to offer a diehard like me. As always, I'm Alex, and this is First Five, where I ask if games are worth your time, not your money. I played a game for five hours, and I'm going to tell you if those were five hours well spent. And today, we're retaking hell in Monster Train. casual term that gets bandied around a bit in video game circles called blizzardification. The blizzardification of RTSs, of MMOs, of 6v6 competitive shooters. But the basic idea is to take an already kind of established genre, shave off all the more peculiar edges, give it the shiniest coat of polish you possibly can, and then make it accessible for the widest audience possible. It leads to extremely entertaining games, but a lot of the weirder experimentation and quirkiness gets left behind in the process. And Monster Train is effectively the blizzardification of deck builders, and true to form, this game has a lot of great, interesting, and more accessible ideas, most notably the champions. Monster Train's version of classes is a choice between five races, each with its own unique set of cards. But on top of that, every race has two separate champions that specialize in different aspects of each set. Your champion is both your most powerful and most consistent card. They come with their own set of starter cards that support their playstyle, will always show up in your opening hand, are free to play, are leagues more powerful than anything else in your deck, and are guaranteed to receive upgrades after every boss, meaning they will always scale through the entire game. There are a lot of implications to this design choice. When you have a guaranteed powerful card in your hand no matter what, runs are a lot more consistent, and it's a lot easier to figure out how this whole deck building thing works by building around that card. It does make Monster Train one of the more approachable games in this genre, but your champion is so reliable that it's always going to be the backbone of your deck that everything else is built to synergize with, which is a bit of a new rhythm. If you want to play with the Hellhorn's Imps, show up as a Shardtail Queen. You want to use the other half of the set and build around the rage mechanic? Bring the Prince instead. Between the champion, a starter artifact you get, and the random freebie cards the game starts giving you after you beat it once, you effectively self-select your deck in the first two minutes of the game. And that can ruin some of the mystique and strategic joy of slowly trying to piece something together as you go, but there's one critical reason why it hasn't bothered me too much. There are just so many different ways to play this game. When you break it down, two champions with three playstyles each means six different ways you can build each of the five clans. And that's before even considering the fact that you also get to choose a second clan to splash into your deck. All of that is a significantly wider playspace than most deck builders can provide, and of the half dozen different playstyles I've tried, every single one of them has been immensely fun to play. And it helps that this playspace is facilitated by Monster Train's other big ideas surrounding the combat itself. It works a little bit like a tower defense in that enemies are slowly climbing up your train towards an end goal and you have to cut them down before they can make it that far. Sometimes a boss will chill on the side of the train that you can whittle down while they send waves after waves of men at you, but every fight ends with a big brawl to the death against a huge health sponge. And this creates a core loop that's both fast-paced and relatively forgiving. Threats don't need to be dealt with or neutralized immediately, you have three whole floors to handle them, so even if they do run amok at first, you have a few turns to recover before they start digging into your real health bar. And even if they do slip past, they can only do so much damage before they die. There are a lot of safety parachutes here before you start seeing actual consequences for a mistake. 
but it's also incredibly difficult to slow the enemy's ascent, so you are on a time limit, and if one wave survives, the next piles in right behind them and now you have two fights on your hands. So even if Monster Train's combat is surprisingly forgiving, it's not just going to let you do whatever you want, and it does strike a very nice balance. The last thing Monster Train has going for it is that it is also so incredibly shiny. The art looks slick, there's a lot of varied and interesting design going on between the different clans, the noises some of the enemies produce do feel truly otherworldly, and I think this might be the first time I've actually enjoyed a deck builder soundtrack. It's kind of the generic fare you'd find in a YouTube playlist titled Epic, Emotional, Inspiring, Powerful, Legendary, Intense Fantasy Music, but that's still better than most of the competitions. They're decent bops. But then we get to the other half of this blizzardification, the stuff that Monster Train simplified, everything that got left behind, all that nitty gritty nuance that got lost in translation. Okay, I'm talking about the overarching metagame. For a deck builder, it is very simple. You still do all the same things you would in any other deck builder. You can get new cards, pick up artifacts that change how your deck works, get rid of old cards, run into random events, and upgrade your spells. But how you go about it has been drastically simplified. In most other deck builders, you do this by carefully plotting out a course across these many branching paths with a whole strategic metagame based around which boons you want to take advantage of. Monster Train boils this entire decision-making process down into a binary choice. Do you want health, some money, and a few upgrades for your spells, or do you want to purge cards, get random events, events and upgrade your minions. Other deck builders also often use their metagame structure to enforce a compelling risk versus reward system. Like if you get to a rest spot and slay the spire right before a big boss with only half your health, do you play it safe and heal, or do you gamble that you can win as is and upgrade your deck instead? Monster Train still maintains a risk reward system, but it appears solely in the form of a slider. If you're feeling lucky, you can flip a pre-fight switch and the enemy will be stronger and drop a bonus reward when you beat them. And if none of that made any sense to you, especially if you've never played a deck builder before, that's probably why Monster Train did away with it. All of these things I'm talking about are small and really crunchy decisions, but in past deck builders, they're also critical things to consider if you want to excel in the game and are integral to the overall feel of it. Even your moment-to-moment -moment activities are weirdly frictionless in Monster Train. Take purging cards, for example. Part of the challenge of a deck builder is not just knowing what cards to add to a deck, but also when and what to take away. The ability to remove cards is usually an extremely rare and coveted resource, one of the hardest to come by in a deck builder. But in Monster Train, you're practically flooded with opportunities to remove cards to the point where I actually passed up chances because I didn't know what else I could possibly get rid of. What results is a metagame where you can do pretty much whatever you want, whenever you want, and there are exceptionally few difficult strategic choices to be made. I never, at any point, felt like I didn't have enough options to purge cards from my deck. I never at any point turned down a card because I thought it couldn't work in my deck or it would make it bloated and ineffective like I regularly would in other deck builders. And that slider I mentioned? I kept it on hard mode for... literally everything. In short, managing my deck in Monster Train was basically effortless, and I'm not sure that's the adjective I'd want my strategic meta layer to get labeled with. And yet, despite having gutted its metagame, Monster Train is still so incredibly fun. But it's fun for entirely different reasons from most deck builders. Instead of a crunchy strategic gauntlet, Monster Train feels more like a mad science lab where every run is a new crazy experiment. Its strategic layer may be thin, but its tactical layer makes up the difference in both its breadth and its depth. <laughs> It also comes with one bonus for me in particular. Because the metagame has been shaved down so much, runs in Monster Train are hella short. Like, even a winning run is barely over an hour. For a deck builder, that's like a third of the length of most other games, at least. And the fact that I can complete an entire run in one sitting while I wind down before bed is a huge mark in its favor. Like, I do not know how to emphasize this enough. And honestly, that fact alone probably makes all the trimming worth it. Which segues us neatly into the big question. What do you get out of five hours with Monster Train? 
And the answer is a shocking amount. A half dozen runs, including those that were successes and those that failed early. And you unlock a surprising amount too. By the end of five hours, I already had three clans and five of the 10 champions unlocked. You can make progress in Monster Train at a pretty rapid pace. And even from the very start, there was already a huge play space to explore. And I have spent almost every minute of those five hours frolicking through that play space. There are a ton of exciting builds and combinations to try out in this game. And I spent my time with it in a mad, delightful rush to sample all of them. I never made the same deck twice, and I can't think of a single one I came away from feeling disappointed. And in the wake of that feeling, I'm forced to accept that a game can't be everything. Monster Train might not be the crunchiest, most strategically nuanced deck builder I've ever played, but it distills all of the genre's most gripping facets into a highly digestible, fast-moving, and most importantly, accessible package. If you skipped it when it came out like I did, you should fix that mistake as soon as you can. And if you haven't tried a deck builder before, there's never been a better time to jump in. And if you enjoyed this review as much as I liked Monster Train, consider supporting me on Patreon. With your generous support, I can start doing all kinds of cool stuff, like more in-depth video essays and five-hour streams where I review games like this in real time. So if any of that sounds cool, please consider becoming a patron today. But I hope you all enjoyed this first five review. Thanks for watching this far, and I'll see you all next week.